Welcome to episode two. It's great to have you join us again for this special webinar series brought to you by the International Dyslexia Association Ontario in partnership with Microsoft. I'm Alicia Smith. And I am Stuart Lulling. In this episode, we'll be looking at support systems for young dyslexics. In episode one, we talked about the importance of supporting dyslexic students and how it's critical to start with offering appropriate support for literacy. And in this episode, we'll delve further into structured literacy and its implementation. We're going to hear from Sarah Peden, a psychologist and dyslexia interventionist from Calgary. Sarah will provide an overview of the principles of effective literacy instruction for students with dyslexia. Then we will be joined by Ron Cadez, a principal in the Louis Riel School District in Manitoba. Ron will speak about his experience in implementing these approaches in a Canadian public school. Sarah, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks so much for inviting me to participate in this webinar series. Addressing the literacy needs of students with dyslexia while also supporting the entire classroom can seem daunting. Sarah, where is the best place for teachers to start? I decided to focus my comments around structured literacy because it provides such a good framework that, of instructional practices that are good for all, harmful to none, and critical for some. So I'll contrast structured literacy with balanced literacy a little bit just at the end after I've explained a little bit about what structured literacy means and is. Uh, but first, let's go into that and talk a bit about both the principles of structured literacy as well as the elements of structured literacy. So what is structured literacy? Really, we're talking about an approach to literacy instruction that includes three different principles and six different elements. It's shown really nicely in the infographic that you can see on this slide that comes from a document provided by the International Dyslexia Association entitled, What is Structured Literacy? A Primer on Effective Reading Instruction. So what are the principles of structured literacy? Structured literacy requires that we teach systematically and cumulatively, explicitly and directly, and diagnostically. So let's just dive into a little bit about what each of those principles really means. Systematic and cumulative means that we know what all of the skills and subskills are that we're required to teach to children in order for them to be effective readers and writers. Cumulatively means that we start at the beginning and we build on what children already know. So what does it mean to teach systematically and cumulatively? It means that we have an overall really big picture of what it is that children need to learn in order to be effective readers and writers. That's the scope. And we have a really clear sequence that we'll teach all those skills in. In my practice, I use a series of decodable texts, and I'm going to tell you more about what decodable texts are a little bit later on. But the series of decodable texts that I use introduces sound symbol correspondences in a particular order. And I know that if I work through that series with my students, then they're definitely going to be taught all of the sound symbol correspondences that they're going to need in order to be proficient readers. Nothing's left to chance. If you think systematic and cumulative and nothing left to chance, you'll be making sure that all of your kids get what they need. So what exactly do we mean by explicit and direct instruction? I'll give you some specific examples when we talk about the elements of phonemic awareness or about phonics. But for right now, just know that it means that we don't expect children to infer what it is that they need to learn. Rather, we're very clear in the messages that we give them about this is what it is that you need to learn. This is what I'm asking you to be able to do. And we explicitly teach the skill that children need. And what about diagnostic instruction? Diagnostic merely means that we know what children can do and we know what they can't do and we can diagnose any gaps in their learning and prescribe what it is that they need to learn next. We don't have to take this diagnostic label too far. It doesn't necessarily mean we need a formal medical diagnosis of something or a diagnosis of a disorder. 
What it means is that we can diagnose a child's needs and prescribe for that. So we've talked about the principles behind structured literacy. Now we need to cover the elements of structured literacy. And although these are listed as six separate elements, it is really important to remember that that doesn't mean that we teach the elements sequentially. We're not finished with phonology before we start teaching sound symbol or finished with sound symbol instruction before we introduce morphology, etc. But we can think about these six elements separately. So the first element that we really need to teach explicitly when using a structured literacy approach is phonology. Phonology refers to the sounds of the language that we're teaching. So we may hear the separate words within sentences, we hear syllables within words, we hear the beginning of the word, that's called the onset, separate from the end of the word, that's referred to as the rhyme of the word, and we can hear each of the individual sounds within words. Those individual sounds are referred to as phonemes, and it's that level of manipulating playing around with, substituting the sounds within words that's called phonemic awareness that is so critical for reading development. Because this phonemic awareness is so critical for orthographic mapping and therefore developing the decoding skills and the fluency that is necessary ultimately for reading comprehension, it's critical that we know how to teach phonemic awareness directly to the children, especially those like children, many children with dyslexia, who struggle with that particular skill. Happily, it can be taught, and resources like the Hegarty curriculum or Kilpatrick's Equipped for Reading Success provide great support for teachers or parents working with their children to learn how to teach these skills and all the activities necessary to practice them to proficiency levels so that children have the basis that they will need for phonic success. Examples of phonemic awareness activities uh, are, uh, for example, separating off the beginning sound in a word. Say pill, but in, now say it again, but don't say p. The answer is ill. What about if you change the beginning sound? Say pill. Now, instead of p, say m, mm, mill. What if you're separating the sounds at the beginning of words? Say glue. Now say it again, but don't say g. You're left with loo. What about substituting? Say glue. Now instead of g, say b, blue. What about substituting vowel sounds in the middle of words? For example, say mit. Now instead of i, say a, mat. These are examples of the kinds of phonemic awareness skills that children must have in order to successfully use phonics and build orthographic mapping skills. David Kilpatrick's Equipped for Reading Success in the Hegarty curriculum will give you all kinds of support in knowing how to teach these uh, skills to all students and particularly those with dyslexia or struggling with reading decoding. The next absolutely foundational element of structured literacy is teaching sound symbol correspondence explicitly, systematically, cumulatively. In my practice, I always start with making sure that children understand the meaning of the term represent. It's very easy to teach. I just get children to represent jumping for me and they jump up out of their chair and they show me jumping and I go, great, you're showing me jumping. And then I have them represent other action words or emotions on their face. And I use the term represent and show somewhat interchangeably. And then I get into talking with them about how I bet you've heard teachers and parents tell you that letters make sounds. I'm going to tell you a secret. Letters don't really make sounds at all. Don't tell anybody. Watch. I can prove it. And I'll hold up a piece of paper that's got lots of letters on it. And I go, see all these letters? Nope. They're not making any sounds at all. They're representing sounds. Let me show you how different letters can represent different sounds. And we go on to teach in that explicit way of showing 
the connection between sound and print. Let me give you an example of explicit instruction for phonemic awareness and phonics using color tiles and letters. There's no specific uh, symbolism of the, the specific colors chosen for this. In fact, I'm not going to use the blue because it's too hard to differentiate it from the purple. Let's say that we're going to want to read the word last. How many sounds do you hear in the word last? L, A, S, T. That's right, four sounds. Let's do it together. L, A, S, T. Last. What sound do you hear? Yes, L comes at the beginning of last. L. My students really liked pushing the color tile right off their whiteboard. L. Ah. What sound do you hear? Last. S. What letter do you need? That's right. S represents S in last. What's the final sound in the word last? That's right. T. Which letter do you need? That's right. T. T represents T in last. What word did you build? Last. Super. Now at this stage I would have children uh, writing that word on their own individual whiteboards, saying the sound as they print each letter. So we again are having multiple uh, exposures to the letter sound connections that they have in their words. I could then do, tell me, what do we do to change last to past? Which sound needs to change? That's right, the first sound would change in last. What do we need instead of L to represent P in past? That's right, P. Can you change past to pest? Which sound needs to change? That's right. The vowel sound changes. A to E. What word do we have? Pest. That's right, pest. It's also really important to remember that after children have been provided explicit and direct instruction with respect to sound symbol correspondences, that they have the opportunity to practice those skills in ways that can be highly successful. So the use of decodable text is a really important part of any structured literacy approach. Decodable text means that the books are written with controlled vocabulary, but not controlled the way they are in level text, um, but rather controlled by the sound symbol correspondences that have already been taught. There are a number of high quality decodable texts now available for many different publishers the use of books where children can read every word in the book because they've been explicitly taught the skills that they need is a really important part of a structured literacy approach and can't be overlooked. Now, I'm not going to have time to go into a lot of detail on each element of structured literacy, but let's just touch on them briefly so that you have a sense of what can be explicitly systematically, cumulatively, and diagnostically taught to children in order to ensure their literacy development. We can teach the syllables of our language. In English, there are six main syllable types. And if we teach children how to recognize those six syllable types, how to try different ways of dividing words down to uh, let those syllable types show 
and then we can pronounce syllable by syllable instead of trying to read longer words as though we can blend 12 or 15 phonemes in a word. Rather, we can read each syllable separately and blend three or four or five syllables together, which is much more consistent with what human uh, cognitive architecture allows for, what it is that our brains can actually do. So teaching syllable types is important. How about morphology? Morphology is studying the meaningful parts of words. So a morpheme is the smallest part of a word that carries meaning all by itself. So for example, the word cat has one morpheme, but the word cats has two morphemes. The S in cats represents that it's plural or more than one. We can teach children right from the earliest stages of reading and writing about the meaningful parts of words, prefixes, suffixes, uh, inflected word endings that mark verb tenses, for example, ed marking the past tense, which actually is pronounced either ed or d or t. The same morpheme can be pronounced three different ways depending on the word that it's in. So again, morphology is a critical piece of teaching structured literacy and it can be done in a systematic and cumulative way just like teaching sound simple correspondence can. Syntax merely refers to the arrangement or the order of words and phrases within sentences. So this is an area that can easily be explicitly taught to children in both oral language and written language. How is it that we are allowed to arrange word order and phrases to make properly constructed sentences? Of course, syntax also impacts the meaning or the semantics in our language. Semantics is the last area of a structured literacy approach, the last element. Semantics refers to meaning, and meaning, of course, is heavily influenced by the vocabulary that we use. One of the most important pieces to teach explicitly in a structured literacy approach is vocabulary. We can use an approach like thinking about tiered vocabulary, where tier one words are those that children almost always learn, just automatically in their oral language development. Those are often words that are taught at home or outside of school. Uh, tier three vocabulary, the words that are used and taught in specific subject areas like science or social studies uh, or mathematics. The tier two ones are the ones that we often need to attend to explicit instruction in uh, literacy. So these are the words that provide more sophisticated uh, language for children to use and understand um, beyond the simple words but not into the subject specific words. Um, so if Isabel Beck is an author that's written a ton about uh, robust vocabulary instruction, and of course vocabulary instruction involves a lot more than just having children look up the meaning of words. Um, that's never gonna be enough all by itself for children to have had one exposure to a word. They need to develop um, the word understanding in lots of different contexts and be able to use the words. So semantics is a critical aspect of structured literacy approaches. And finally, let me just briefly try to contrast balanced literacy and structured literacy. Um, back in the late 90s, early 2000s, the term balanced literacy was one I used a lot because I was referencing a balance between the importance of focusing on language comprehension and reading comprehension and the phonics or decoding skills that children needed to learn in the earliest stages of reading. Unfortunately, at least in my opinion, balanced literacy lost the actual balance and word work and phonics became just one small part of what was being taught to children and really we were back to more of a whole language approach um, which just has no research support and in fact the theories behind whole language have been debunked scientifically. So a structured literacy approach is supported by the science of reading 
implicit and direct instruction and avoids some of the things that you'll still see in a balanced literacy approach, like uh, trying to figure out words based on the pictures or trying to figure out what words might be based on what word might fit in that. A balanced literacy approach sometimes can be another way of describing a multi-cueing approach to reading. And that's problematic, whereas in a structured literacy approach, we're teaching children how to figure out what the words are by figuring out what the words are. In other words, the decoding is at the word level and can be accomplished by children successfully when they've been taught those skills of breaking down words into their parts and blending them back together. So uh, while there's certainly elements of a balanced literacy approach that may uh, make a lot of sense, a structured literacy approach has a lot of research backing behind it and fits with the science of what we know about reading instruction. That's amazing, Sarah. This gives a great grounding and an excellent start to anyone that's new to structured literacy. Thank you so much. Yes, and as we heard in episode one from Jamie Metzella, Structured literacy represents a fundamental shift in instructional practices, and implementation is really the key to success. Yes, and we're excited to have Ron Cadez join us. Ron, can you tell us a little bit more about your background? Thank you very much for having me. I spent the last 16 years in school leadership in K-12 French Immersion Schools in the Littoral School Division, and 13 of those years I spent as a principal in some configuration of K-8. I'm currently principal of a K-5 school, and I'm here today to talk to you about the work that I'm currently doing in my school, but especially the work that I did in my last school, which was a K-6 to school. So Ron, how did you actually come to learn about structured literacy? It's funny you should ask that question. I think it's important I tell people a little bit about my background before I talk about how I learned about structured literacy. As administrators, we all come into our profession from different parts of, the, of our education field. And for me, I came into this as a guitar and band teacher in high school. I spent 10 years teaching in the classroom uh, different music programs at the high school level. And my first real introduction to elementary school was when I became the principal of a K-8 school. The learning curve was definitely large, and I had to spend a lot of time figuring out how little kids learn, what their social and emotional needs are, and especially how literacy is learned over time. And so I've been fortunate to be surrounded by wonderful people. And I say that only to reassure everybody that's listening that no matter what your background is, you'll be able to learn the different things that you need to learn to implement a, an effective literacy program in your school. From what you have learned, what advice do you have for other principals who are looking to bring structured literacy into their schools? I think one of the biggest lessons that I've learned is that change always starts with the principal. And as anyone's looking to make a change in uh, literacy practice in the early years in particular, you may be wondering, well, what could be an impetus for that change? And as a principal, you're going to look at your current situation as a leader. Where do you find yourself right now? In myself, in my last situation in the school I was in a couple of years ago, I was in a place where the data was telling us that there was a problem, that we needed to do some things a little bit differently, but I didn't really know how to make that change or what that change would even look like. In my current situation, I'm looking at things and saying, well, maybe we could do things a little bit better. And I know what the research is, but I'm a little concerned as to how I would put the pieces of that together in my current situation. So I think from a principal, we need to figure out first of all where we're at, and then we can lead our staff in a different direction. So in order to lead that change, and one of the things that can stimulate a change within a system is to look at data. And for me as a leader, I think it's important to have that data at the center of every conversation. And I'm going to talk a little bit about ways that I use data to make it very personal for the staff. The other thing I wanted to look at as I'm looking through my experiences is to who are the people that have the experiences that I will need to tap into to make this a successful change. It's important to understand what the strengths of your team are. And finally, as your role as a leader, it's important to structure all of that so that you can make sure that it has a, a lasting impact on the students that you're going to be serving. How do you bring people together? What type of learning do you provide for them? How do you get the information and learn together with your staff in order to make that? Build that trust among the members of the team. As a leader, we're always modeling for others, and the, the, the behaviors that we model become the ones that are the acceptable behaviors for the staff. And they're the ones that end up inspiring others to take direction in ways they might not have otherwise done. And so as a leader, it's also important to reflect upon what are the behaviors that you're modeling as you're doing your work. Now, as I look at my first example is the experience in my last school at Ecole Howden. Um, the, the data that we had looked at showed us that there was an ongoing problem, but that's not to say that wonderful things weren't happening. We had set up a very extensive RTI approach to literacy that had uh, produced wonderful results. We had reduced significantly the number of students that were uh, delayed in their uh, attainment of what we would expect from them in reading. But at the same time, there were some kids that continued to struggle. 
<clears throat> and we weren't sure what to do about it. And so as the leader, as I look back on what I did, <clears throat> I modeled a lot of different behaviors for them. One of them was to reflect. We looked at the data very closely to define the current situation and talked about why that was. What are some of the theories we could come up with, how we could do better? We were very curious in our approach to doing our work. It made us ask a lot of questions and seek out a lot of new learning. We learned how to work together and talk about the different experiences that we had and how to seek support from people that knew more about this than we did. How could we learn from others? And as a result, what we built was a strong team. It was a network of people working together from within the school and from the exterior of the school. So my role at the leader then became to navigate through those different team uh, members and find out what their strengths were to make them uh, fit into the best possible role they could to have the biggest impact. And so really what that looks like in defining the problem through the data is for us, we made it personal. For me as a leader, I thought it was important for us to not look at just numbers. We couldn't just say five, 6% of our kids are significantly delayed in reading. That wasn't significant enough for the staff to take action. And so what I did initially was talk to our literacy teachers, talk to our student services teachers, and when they had them share the stories about those students, who are these kids? Let's put names to those numbers and find out who they are and what their journey has been. And what we learned in doing that was that it was a long journey, that in spite of all the intervention in the RTI that we had in place, these students were continuing to experience the same problems they experienced for several years. And the teachers were feeling frustrated by the fact that they had just hit a wall. We don't have any other strategies to work with this child. What can we do to make it better for them? I also know of a situation where I shared some data and color coded it for a, a teacher at one point and handed it to her. And she wrote back to me a day or so later after she looked at it and thought about it and said, don't ever send me that again. Looking at the numbers and seeing the colors and seeing that some students were still struggling in ways she had not expected was surprising to her and kind of making her angry in her work. And as a result, she was motivated to learn more. Neither of us had the answer at that moment, but at the same time, we went. it was important for us to decide that we had to learn, but we had to learn together. So for me as an administrator, it was to tell those teachers, I don't have the answer. It's important for us to be able to admit what we do not know. When teachers see us in vulnerable situations and as learners with them, they're more inspired to learn. It's okay to make mistakes, it becomes safe. And the way that we can learn is by seeking out the best sources possible. So for us, it was to seek out inputs from the people that we had from within our system first. And that included our psychologists, speech language pathologists, as well as occupational therapists. They all had tremendous insight to offer us. None of them had the complete picture of all the answers, but we brought them into the conversation. And as a result, they became essential team members and they were doing the learning right along with us and it became a broader team to work with. Beyond that, we can also make things safe for our staff when it's time to implement change. And when it came time for me to implement change in my past experiences, one of the things I learned is learning side by side and working side by side your teachers can be very powerful. There was a moment once where I was working on implementing changes to uh, practices in teaching writing. And I knew that uh, one uh, specific team was a little bit reluctant to get on board because they were concerned they may not be able to get this. And so after getting external advice and having some time to reflect upon the situation, I decided I needed to get involved. And so at which point I did all the planning with them. I did co-teaching in the classroom. And for me as a high school band teacher, guitar teacher coming in to teach grade one, they knew I was well out of my comfort zone. It was important for them to see me in that role. And when the lesson bombed, I was the first one afterwards to ask for the feedback from the teacher and admit openly, you know what? I don't think that went well at all. And she saw it was okay not to be successful every time you go in front of the kids. Sometimes it just doesn't work. And as a result, she was able to implement things in ways that I don't think she would have otherwise been able to do. So as a leader, don't be scared to take risks alongside your teachers. It's good for them to see you in that situation. Now in my current school, I walk in uh, in my first year now, and I'm, I already know a little more about structured literacy, whereas in the past one, I didn't know that. And as I see that situation evolve, I have to come in and think about how can I put some of those pieces together in my current school? So the first thing I want to acknowledge as you come in is to say that those same practices I've implemented in the last one, the modeled behaviors, would be the ones I want to model more explicitly this time around because I now know those are good behaviors to model. Those of reflection, looking at data more specifically and seeing what we could do better. It's not about necessarily improvement uh, because things are broken, but it's also looking at things that are working well and seeing how they could improve and to make them better. I think that's a, a very fine line that you have to be careful about when you're a leader that you're not looking at identifying problems per se, but you're looking at ways that things can improve. The other part was to network. And I'll explain in a minute about a situation where I was able to bring in people to influence things uh, as potential changes in my school, that uh, we bring in the right people for that have the right information 
And we can certainly get things to move ahead a lot more effectively than if we try and do everything ourselves or try and work from within. Uh, it also instills an idea of teamwork. The idea that I've learned throughout my career, it talks about John Hattie talks about this all the time, about collective efficacy. We work much more effectively as a team, but as the leader, it's up to you to structure that team. Who are the members of the team? What are their roles? And how do you set it up so that it's a safe place for them to ask difficult questions? Take the strengths of your members, celebrate those strengths and put them in positions where they will be successful, but also be able to take risks. And the last thing that I think is very important for all of us to know is that it's okay to just take small steps. And I'll explain a small step that I've taken this year that'll give you some ideas to what I mean, because small steps add up over time. Do not think that you're gonna change the entire school system and the way that people teach within a few months or a year. This takes a lot of time, but take people where they're at and move them ahead a little bit and you'll see, you'll make tremendous gains. So in my current situation where I know what much of the research says, but I still continue to learn a great deal about it, um, the important first steps for me to do as a leader coming in is to Look at the positives that are happening. In my school right now, there's wonderful intervention systems that are in place. There's great teaching strategies. The data is telling us there's a lot of good results, but it's to celebrate those things with my staff, identify the practices that I see openly with them that, are, that are need to be reinforced. And also to look at it and say, well, maybe we can just look at things and maybe they can get just a little bit better. So we wanna value and respect the work that's been done, but also look at it through the data to see, maybe we can do a little bit better. In my current situation, I've also added extra data to the plate. I've asked them to collect a little bit more, and we're collecting it together as a team. I'm part of the collection process, so are my, my teachers. And I think by us seeing what that looks like, when you're collecting data, for example, uh, looking at a student doing a RAN screening tool, uh, you'll see the difference between a student that can do that test in 45 seconds compared to 200 seconds, you get a much better appreciation as to what you're facing and what you could potentially affect in terms of change over the long term. So as the leader, we look to provide learning resources to our staff and to bring those people in that can provide those resources. My staff this year in kindergarten, I brought the team together along with the student services team to work with our student speech language pathologist because I believe she had an important lesson for us to listen to about the importance of phonological awareness in the early years. Now with that lesson, I'm not expecting the kindergarten staff to all of a sudden be masters of phonological awareness, include all elements of it in everything that they do in their daily practice. But what I do expect is for us to be able to now have a conversation based on a common understanding of the importance of it. That maybe here and there for five minutes a day, a couple times a day, they'll integrate different ideas from, from what they've learned in that lesson. And that, would, that itself will make a difference. It is a very small step, but a significant one nonetheless. And it allows us to think about things through a common lens now. And as we build that common lens, we get to build common values. And so that is the way that you build an effective team. Once your values are aligned to what counts really when you're teaching a certain subject, and in this case, teaching literacy, once we build that common understanding and value the same things, then we're all moving in the same direction. So I encourage administrators to not get discouraged by the fact that they either may not know what they don't know yet, or that they think that they may not be able to effectuate enough change in a short period of time. Take your time. It's okay to take time. Those small changes do make a difference. And by me sitting in that learning with them, I've made it important for them to learn, and I've also made it safe for them to learn. We're learning this together. I have to articulate that all the time that we're just taking small steps. So my final thoughts on this would be that as the principal, we're often talked about as the lead teacher, and, and maybe that's historically what we had been. But in the context, I'd like to think of our role more so as the lead learner. And the type of uh, learning that we do and the way that we learn and the way that we articulate our thinking back to our staff really has an impact on how they will learn as well and how that learning then transfers to the students. We need to be mindful of those practices because we're constantly modeling the good and the bad at the same time. But it's important to reinforce those ones more explicitly that we want teachers to follow. Um, those reflections are important. The best teachers I've ever worked with have been the most uh, reflective practitioners. They're the ones that go back after every lesson and say, if only I had done this, and if only I had done that differently, I could have done more in that lesson. You wanna model that type of practice. It's not you're striving for perfection, but you're striving for constant improvement. And that really is the heart of learning. What more could we want from our students than to be able to sit back and think about how they could actually do better every time that they tried to do a task. Well, if they see their teachers doing that on a constant basis and their teachers see their leaders doing that, this is an important uh, step for us to take the model for others. Again, I go back to John Hattie's efficacy, uh, collective efficacy. Uh, he talks about how important that is and it's one of the most important things for us to have. First, to believe that we can have an impact on the student's improvement 
but also for us to work together in an efficient manner so that we can affect that change that we want to affect. We build a common set of values through common experiences. As the leader, it's up to you to guide the building of those common experiences and articulate what those common values then become. As schools, I find we are often isolated. We look to those people that do not work with our immediate team uh, as people that are in to only come in after the fact. For example, if we look at our clinicians, our psychologist, speech language, and so on, they're often called in when we don't know what to do anymore. What I'm arguing is that in my situations, I've always brought them in as advisors, uh, that they're uh, pre pre uh, proactive uh, information. They're people that can provide us with insight into what the best practices could be, provide insight from their professional perspective that we would not otherwise have. So I encourage you to invite those people into your conversation so that you can learn what they have to offer and see you'll probably want to they'll probably want to learn more with you and your team they'll be an integral part i know in our situation they're an integral part of the the preemptive stage of learning as opposed to just the reactive stage afterwards and beyond those doors of your school and your school district it's also important to look into your community and beyond i'm collaborating with people across north america that are giving me insight as to how i can do my practice better Find the best possible people in the field that you're working with. And in this case, in structured literacy, there's plenty of great names to seek out. Um, and it's important that we tap into those resources so that we have the best possible information. As the principal, you are the lead learner. Learn as much as you can and never stop learning. Thanks, Ron. That was amazing. I really appreciate how open and honest you are about your experiences of implementing structured literacy in your school. It's been a pleasure being part of this. Thank you very much. Given that learning to read is so important and so complex, Sarah, can I just start by asking you what you think the key takeaway from this episode is? So I was particularly grateful to hear in Ron's presentation uh, the emphasis that he put on the importance of collaboration. We all have to work together to make sure that all of our students learn to read and write to the greatest extent possible. And when Ron spoke about valuing the contributions that can be made by people like myself, psychologists or speech and language pathologists, there's occupational therapists in schools, physiotherapists, many, many professionals that have expertise to add and to contribute to teachers' work in making sure that children learn to the best extent possible. And so that emphasis on collaboration was particularly critical to me. I tend to think not just about teaching and learning, but about learning and teaching. So the expertise that school psychologists and speech and language pathologists bring in uh, about how children learn feeds into and informs how teachers can best teach. Um, so it was exciting to me to hear that really positive message about collaboration. And I really thank school administrators and teachers who are willing to do that as we all try to do our best to work for what's best for kids. Thank you for sharing that, Sarah. I think it's important that we recognize the contributions that people from outside of our school walls can provide to us in informing our practice. In fact, in my own school right now and in my past experience, I have brought in the clinicians, uh, psychology and speech language in particular, to look over our screening data. I, I generally don't analyze it first, it's them who gets it first. It's important that they tell me what they observe because they have an expertise to offer to this. And from them, I can ask questions that can clarify for me. I think they have a valuable role. So it's important for us to look beyond our walls to find the best people qualified to work with so that we can have the best information to inform our practice and have an impact on our students. Thank you, Ron and Sarah. Thank you both for being a part of this. I think it's amazing to consider interdisciplinary collaboration as one of the keys to student success. So thank you for bringing that up. Now an aim for this series was always to look at a broader picture for dyslexics. Building on from Dr. Nicola Jones Stokery's presentation in episode one, an important part of supporting a dyslexic student's emotional needs is to break down the perception that dyslexia is a barrier to success. One group that has made that their mission is Made by Dyslexia, and I'm super excited to be joined here today by Kate Griggs, the founder and CEO of Made by Dyslexia. Kate, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's um, an absolute pleasure to be here and um, to be able to talk to you about Made by Dyslexia and everything that we're trying to achieve. Just as a little bit of background, Made by Dyslexia is a global charity, and we are led and supported by successful dyslexics. Uh, our mission is to help the world properly understand, value and support dyslexia. 
Um, just to kick everything off, I'd really like to play uh, a film by some of the celebrities that are supporting us, just to give you a flavour of what we're trying to achieve and what we're all about. If you're dyslexic, it's kind of your superpower. It's like the way that you think. Our brains, uh, they're wired to, I think, process information differently. It's just the way that you see the world. I don't think people do think the way I think. <laughs> and we're curious, uh, we're creative. The way I see the world might be different from somebody else, but that's valid. In fact, it's vital. The imagination, the storytelling, the communication, the empathy, all these positives. We can simplify things. Uh, we see the big picture. In a world which is pretty competitive, I think to be able to look at it differently is a huge advantage. Dyslexic minds have exactly the skills we need for the workforce of tomorrow. My spelling makes people laugh. It makes me laugh, actually. And my reading, if I'm sight reading, oh, it's, it's a complete joke. School was pretty difficult, to be honest. Um, I wasn't a, a massive fan of the classroom. I used to always hide in the store cupboard, but fortunately my English teacher knew that that was my spot. <laughs> Dyslexia can cause real challenges in traditional education. Memorising lots of facts and figures, uh, it can be difficult. We're not teaching kids to think, we're teaching kids to pass exams. If education is a challenge for a child with dyslexia, you need to understand how to educate them so that it isn't. A challenge. One in five children suffer from dyslexia. That's 20% of the classroom. And yet, teachers aren't trained to recognise it. I think it's vital that teachers are trained about dyslexics. Because the world is changing and, uh, and imagination is key to everything. And there's going to be a lot of kids whose potential are lost unless we train our teachers to effectively teach them. Imagine a world where you've got, you know, a little where you've got like a force of people who have this gift of dyslexia educated in a way that supports them. It means anything's possible, you know. It means anything is possible. So picking up on Orlando Bloom's comment there about anything is possible, um, as I mentioned in the intro, we are led by successful dyslexics. Um, most of us have had the opportunity to have the most incredible supportive education and supportive family that's enabled us to go on and achieve some, some fantastic things. And as a charity, our mission is to help everybody, every dyslexic in the world, to do the same. All of that starts with teacher training because all of us have had that amazing start in life where teachers understood how to support us. They were able to look at, at the strengths that dyslexics have and focus on our strengths and, and support us through that, through the education process. 18 months ago, we partnered with Microsoft and together we are producing a series of teacher training films which are available for free on the Microsoft Educator community. Last year, we released the first uh, two programs, um, Dyslexia Awareness Part 1 and Dyslexia Awareness Part 2. You can see both of the um, links uh, here for you to actually click on and, and watch those uh, programs. The training features two of the uh, leading schools in the world that support dyslexia. Uh, Millfield School in the UK that was the first school in the world to support dyslexic students, um, particularly with a focus on strengths. And Millfield was set up back in the 1930s. Uh, and we've also partnered with the Skank School in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, who were set up in the 1970s, uh, supporting dyslexic students, um, and again, with a focus on strengths. Both of the schools use all the evidence-based methodologies that we know absolutely work for these dyslexic students. And the uh, dyslexia awareness training is uh, features experts from those schools sharing their wisdom and expertise with uh, the audience. Uh, and then it's dotted through with some fantastic stories from successful dyslexics. It's very inspiring, very easy to watch, lots of information that you can consume in a really easy manner. Um, and it takes each course takes about an hour. So I really would urge everybody to, to click on the links and watch it because it's a really amazing way of getting lots of fantastic information very quickly. Um, our mission is that every single teacher in the world should have dyslexia awareness training because if you do, you understand what more you need to learn um, and how, how what works for dyslexic students actually works for all students. So it's an absolute win-win situation. 
It's truly amazing to see such rich media supporting dyslexics. And Kate, you are actually going to take over our fourth and final episode of this series. What should we expect to see? So we're very excited about taking over the, the fourth episode. Um, and in that, we're going to be talking very much about the future of dyslexia and the importance that dyslexic thinking skills play in the future of the world and the future of work. Um, the the um, episode will feature the headmaster of Millfield School, who we've mentioned as uh, features in our training, and also the headmaster of the Skank School, who again feature in the training. Um, we're going to be talking about the amazing research that we did last year with EY, the big consultancy firm, that looks at dyslexic thinking skills and actually maps them directly across the World Economic Forum's skills for the future. Um, very, very compelling evidence that the world needs the type of thinking that dyslexics have and the world needs it now. So again, it's going to be very much talking about the need to skill up teachers, to skill up schools and to skill up parents so they know to be focusing on all the amazing things that dyslexics can do and the huge value that that has in the world today. Thanks, Kate. That was amazing and certainly a fitting way to conclude this webinar series. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to see everybody in the fourth episode. Now, let's not jump ahead too far. Yes, indeed. In our next episode, episode three, we're gonna shift the focus towards technology and how it can be used to empower students who learn differently. The episode will include presentations from Rachel Berger, assistive technology specialist with Microsoft. Rachel is also an executive director of Decoding Dyslexia Minnesota, as well as Mike Tholston, principal product manager on the Microsoft education team. Really looking forward to seeing that. And that's actually it from Alicia and I. Feel free to get in touch if you have any questions or comments. Yes, and stay tuned to the IDA Ontario website and join our email list where you can receive continuous updates, news and resources from IDA Ontario. And thanks so much for joining us for this series. Bye. <laughs> Goodbye.